this audience. So it is my pleasant duty to introduce my two great friends who are going to be panelists today. And um, starting off first is uh, Mr. Girish Solanki. Girish is a consultant neurosurgeon, and I always get the Mr. right, don't forget. Um, Girish is a, is a consultant neurosurgeon, the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at the Birmingham Children's Hospital. But he's a lot more than that. He he's, he's actually still goes on record as holding, the, being the chairman of the last physical ISPN <laughs> meeting to be held. And I hope he doesn't remain the last person to have held a physical ISPN meeting. But uh, Girish is, uh, is a person that we all know because he's uh, an incredibly sociable person and you find him on all meetings and nowadays on the computer every time you switch it on in some virtual congress or the other. But Girish and, um, and his colleagues in Birmingham have been interested in the craniovertebral area and particularly in Chiari malformations uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, perhaps because uh, one of his uh, senior colleagues was one of the first to start discussing the etiology of, of syringomyelia and uh, what, it, what uh, it does to the spinal cord. And that was none other than Bernard Williams, a man who I had the good fortune to work with for a very short period of time. Uh, so Girish, welcome. And Girish is going to talk to us. His topic is actually treatment options and simple theory malformations, but he's mentioned to me a number of times in various communications that there is no such thing as a simple Chiari malformation. And he's going to talk about all this treatment for all the Chiari malformations that he knows of. So Girish will kick off first. Uh, just before he does, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce another friend of mine and a man who, who I probably hold in in very high esteem, not only as a neurosurgeon, but for various other achievements that most other neurosurgeons have not been able to do, including being, I think, the only neurosurgeon who's managed to get up Mount Everest. And, um, and uh, Doug, I think, holds a record for that because I don't think Girish is going to do that in 10 lifetimes, and I'm sure I wouldn't in 100 lifetimes. But, um, uh, but Doug, uh, apart from um, scaling Everest, is a professor of neurosurgery, is chief of the division of pediatric neurosurgery at the University of Utah, and um, is a head of pediatric neurosurgery at the primary children's hospital at Salt Lake City in Utah, USA. And Doug has done seminal work in the craniovertebral junction, and somebody I think I've learned a huge amount of, about uh, various problems in the pediatric spine. And it, it's been always a, a great, great occasion whenever I've managed to uh, share a platform or uh, an auditorium with Doug. So welcome, Doug. Uh, without much ado, I think we'll start off and we'll kick off with um, Girish's presentation. So Girish Solanki to take us through the okay. various protocols that he follows for management of theory malformations. But those of you in the audience who wish to ask questions, you can put it into the Q&A. And uh, we'll try and ensure, ensure that we get um, as many answered as we can. So Girish, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. And uh, also, I wanted to uh, thank Deepak for giving me the honor to uh, address the uh, Indian Society. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I, I feel very uh, um, uh, grateful and um, uh, I, I feel that you have honored me by inviting me to talk about uh, an important topic, but also a topic very close to my heart. As Sandeep, you've said, you know, Bernard Williams started it for us in Birmingham and uh, Spiros and Tony Hockley, of course, then continued that. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to keep the flag flying. Now, the uh, topic, of course, uh, is Chiaris and uh, um, I will speak on the, what uh, Sandeep has asked me to do, which is simple Chiaris. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, if I just do that, my lecture will finish in five minutes. So I, thought I would also talk a little bit about the algorithm that we have developed in Birmingham. And I hope that that will complement uh, Doug's presentation. Of, uh, what I've done is basically remove the parts that uh, would clash with Doug uh, as much as I understand uh, your presentation would be addressing those areas. So, you know, the title here would be Treatment Options in Simple Chiari. But um, 
I really don't have many treatment options in simple chiari because as I said to Sandeep, I tend not to operate on them. So a new algorithm to manage chiari malformations in syringomyelia, uh, and that I would hope would provide a good foundation for your presentation. Uh, so this is you know, we, it's all started and I work. Uh, it looks quite uh, aged from, you know, outside and it's not that different on the inside as well. I have no conflicts of interest. And as I said uh, in the introduction, what I really wanted to talk about is if we're going to talk about operating on Chiaris, then we should understand Chiaris very well. And there is no consensus on, you know, the whole, uh, you know, thing about Chiari. You know, is this a pathology? Is this secondary to other pathologies? You know, whether seeing a myelia, you know, lie, and uh, what is the uh, you know, relationship between those two. So what I thought is I'll talk a little bit about the first thing that we talk about, the word malformation, and try and introduce the word deformation in, in our nomenclature. Uh, then talk about the physics of hernia, because we call Chiari as a hindbrain hernia, and uh, hernia progression and basis for rational treatment of any hernia anywhere in the body talk about the mechanism of a, you know, what we call a strangulated hernia, a concept of uh, supertentorial crowding as part of uh, what is causing a hernia to progress uh, in the background of a small posterior fossa as contributors. And then, you know, I'll go into slightly greater detail on what, exact, what exactly causes or is associated with Chiari and single myelia. And I've, you know, quite specifically withdrawn comments about skull-based anomalies and spinal anomalies, and I'll leave those for Doug to deal with. Uh, and then natural history of Chiari progression. So the stuff that, you know, you would say, you know, the foundation for discussion, uh, and that's what I'll do. So starting with the definition. Uh, so Barkovich in 1986 kind of cemented the definition of uh, a Chiari as a descent of the cerebellar tonsils five millimeters below the foramen magnum. And that is to date still accepted as uh, by most radiologists, although I think neurosurgeons would challenge, uh, surgically speaking, that they'll probably operate on Chiaris that are not five, but even zero millimeters. So, but radiologically, that's the definition. And then I want to take you to this uh, di difference between what is a malformation and what is a deformation. And really speaking, you know, congenital malformations can be defined as structural or functional anomalies that occur during intrauterine life. And these conditions develop prenatally or may be identified before or after birth or later in life. But malformations do not grow or progress in size as a tumor would. On the other end, when you think about deformations, this is the action or process of deforming or distorting a structure or its shape according to flattening or elongation. That's what deformation is. That means you need something on the outside to be putting pressure uh, to cause a change in the shape of that structure. And deformation is caused by external forces over a period of time and deformation can be progressive, stable, or even regress as the forces that act on the structure change. And this very much is, is the introduction that I want to give about the Chiari, that I don't believe a Chiari in all cases of malformation, but in many or probably most cases that progress is, will turn out to be a deformation. And the second point that I wanted to clarify was a hernia. So a hernia is a condition in which a part of an organ is displaced, protrudes through the wall of the cavity containing it. So if you got, bowel in the abdominal cavity and that herniates through the inguinal uh, ligament uh, and uh, lands up in the groin, that's a hernia. Uh, if the intestine goes through the abdominal wall, that's umbilical hernia. And equally, if the cerebellar tonsils go to the foramen magnum, that's a hernia. And it's what we call a hindbrain hernia. So the basis for a hernia development, by definition, require two compartments and a connecting orifice. Ultimately, all hernias are caused by a combination of pressure in one compartment with a widening of the orifice connecting the two compartments. That means the orifice becomes incompetent. And then the pressure on the organ or tissue that's herniating uh, has to increase to allow that you know, organ to herniate through uh, the opening or a weak spot. And the treatment objectives in a hernia are to reduce the pressure in the compartment with the herniating tissue 
or tighten the orifice to reduce the hernia to prevent recurrences. But of course, in, in our case, uh, in the case of a foramen magnum, it's pretty impossible for us to tighten the orifice to reduce the hernia. So the only option we got really is to reduce the pressure in the compartment with the herniating tissue. But our current treatment for Chiaris do not meet these objectives at all. And this is why I always feel that what we're doing is actually making the hernia worse by removing the opistion and making the uh, incompetent uh, foramen magnum orifice even bigger. And how could that ever be a treatment for a hernia? Any general surgeon would tell you you shouldn't do it. So the pathophysiology of Chiari malformations, we know by experimental models that Chiari malformation is a primary paraxial, paraxial mesodomal insufficiency occurring after the closure of the neural tube, uh, you know, the falls take place. The primary factor for the formation of hindbrain hernia is therefore considered to be a small posterior fossa due to the underdeveloped uh, occipital bone. And the main objective of surgical treatment is directed to restore the normal uh, cerebral, uh, cerebral spinal fluid dynamics at the cranial vertebral junction. And I think that pretty much everybody agrees to this. So then, you know, where are we with Chiari? So the first thing I thought I would do is to learn about the natural history of Chiaris because that kind of tells us who we should be treating or not. And the largest study so far uh, was the one that was done in John Hopkins uh, by Ben, uh, Jeffrey Meadows and Ben Carson and colleagues. And they looked at a very large, about 25,000 uh, MRI scans, uh, uh, consecutive scans, and they found about 175 scans uh, with a radiological diagnosis of Chiari, that means more than five millimeters. And of those, uh, about 14% uh, of those patients, about 25, if I remember correctly, uh, were asymptomatic. They had no symptoms. And when they looked at the association of asymptomatic patients, they found that only one patient actually had either an osseous anomaly or a syringomyelia, which means that in asymptomatic patients, it's extremely rare to have the complex Chiari phenomena that often drives us to surgery. And the average tonsillar hernia in those patients about 11.4 millimeters. Now this study, when I looked carefully at this, only had six children uh, under 18. So in, in essence, it's probably more of an adult Chiari study than pediatric. But even then, I think some of the findings were important for us. In, for example, in relationship to the cisterna magna, there was a very good correlation between the hernia, uh, the progression of the cerebellar uh, tonsillar herniation to the size of the cisterna magna. And I thought that this is something that we are quite familiar, that as the cisterna magna reduces in size, uh, that there is an increase in the um, cerebellar tonsillar descent. Uh, the second paper that I found extremely useful looking at the natural history was the one from Professor DeRocco's team in Rome, uh, and they looked at the natural history of Chiari anomaly. And what they found is that half of the patients were incidental findings. An MRI scan was done for something else, and they found the Chiari. And only 22% of those Chiaris actually had any clinical worsening. Uh, but only 14% progressed to surgery, suggesting that 86% of Chiaris actually don't need any surgery. And that's a large number of patients that shouldn't be touched. Uh, equally, uh, a paper from uh, John Jane, uh, he looked at 700 asymptomatic children with Chiari uh, without syrinx, and he, he, he basically discovered this, they did not exhibit uh, new onset symptoms, only 5% did, or development of a syrinx subsequently, 2 to 3%. And in nearly 100 published cases of symptomatic Chiari 1 without syrinx, that only about half the children report symptomatic, sorry, that half the children report symptomatic improvement and very few report symptomatic worsening, only 7%. So therefore, this is another study suggesting that the natural history of Chiari 1s is a benign history. And uh, John Jin uh, completes his, his, uh, concludes in his paper, that their review of asymptomatic Chiari ones with or without steering suggests that the natural history is much more favorable than previously acknowledged, and that the literature generally favors conservative management of these cases. And he suggested that we should really be looking at symptomatic pediatric Chiaris 
and understand those cases better rather than just look at Chiari's uh, without considering uh, whether these are actually causing any problems or not. Of course, you know, we, we could always say well, what is symptomatic because there are thousands of symptoms that would go with the Chiari, but that is a different topic altogether. Uh, there's another interesting study, which I'm always fond of quoting, which is from uh, Bob Keating. Um, and uh, he talks about the long-term outcomes of children with an incidentally discovered Chiari. So what do you do if you do an MRI scan and you find a Chiari? And that's a very common thing. I get re referred all the time. A patient has got seizures, they do an MRI scan and they find a Chiari. A patient has trauma, they do an MRI scan, they find a Chiari. A patient has developmental delay, they do an MRI scan, they find a Chiari. A patient has headaches, they do an MRI, they find a Chiari. So all of these are actually incidental findings of Chiari, and my clinic is full of them. And what do you do with them? And Bob did a fantastic study, and he looked at this quite carefully, and he discovered that in his experience, again, more than 80% of the patients don't need anything done. And you found that the surgical groups could be divided into two. One, those that required surgery within six months and others sometime later. It could be a year, it could be two years, something like that. So only 16.5% of the patients actually required intervention. And of those, only... Uh, only 10% of the total number actually requires surgery pretty much uh, after diagnosis. That means within the first six months. And those were universally associated with a series or a neurological dysfunction. Uh, so the driver here appears that if you have a series or neurological dysfunction, then you're more likely to consider this patient a surgical candidate. And he also reported in his series, a smaller subset of patients, about 6.4%, that eventually on follow-up required uh, later surgery. That means more than six months. And uh, he thought uh, on, on, on his reporting that only the presence of syringe myelia was statistically significant for the need of surgical intervention. No age, sex, or degree of tonsillar herniation was statistically significant. Uh, and uh, again, in terms of natural history, it looks like every researcher has come to the same conclusion. Incidentally discovered Chiari malformations account for 85% and they are managed conservatively, especially in the presence, in, sorry, in the absence of steering of myelia. Only 16.5% required surgery and only 10% within six months of the initial discovery. Uh, and he quoted a very small subset, about 6% will go on to develop a de novo syrinx or progress with neurological symptoms. And for that reason, imaging follow-up is essential. And uh, he concludes by saying syringomyelia drove early surgical intervention and patients without syringomyelia, surgery is uncommon. A long-term clinical follow-up is recommended. So that kind of very nicely puts me onto the next part of my presentation, which is how do you assess progression of Chiari in children? So there are two ways of doing this. You can do radiological progression, and that means that you have to harass your radiologist to agree to a strategy to monitor every child with Chiari that you have, uh, and clinical assessments. But in my experience has been that clinical assessments um, uh, are not very helpful because this condition is often silent. So a combination of radiological and clinical assessment is essential. So we looked at the data and what it says that like if you do a mean follow-up of between two to four years, that means under five years, you don't find any regression of Chiari and the progression is less than 10%. So the majority of the patients within 90 to 96% show no change in their Chiari. If you, if you do a longer follow-up, more than five years, and this is, uh, for example, the study by Professor De Roque in 2008, our own study in Birmingham 2013, then what we find is that uh, there is greater degree of progression the, between 10 to 14%. There is also regression uh, between three to 5% of the uh, Chiaris will regress spontaneously. So there are, you know, there is this benign group of Chiaris where you don't touch them. And in five years, they will regress spontaneously. And then there is another group uh, which will progress, which is at 10 to 10, 10 to 14 percent. And then finally, the group that doesn't change between 70 to 87 percent. So 
what is the consensus here? The literature consensus is suggesting that you should follow this patient at least five years, if not longer. So longer than five years is the recommended. And you should include radiological progression because clinical progression doesn't tell the whole story. And we know from previous studies and my own study in Birmingham that there is a subset of children that rapidly deteriorate. And this was uh, on a 10 year follow-up of outpatient um, uh, uh, Chiari patients uh, so that these were not patients that came in acutely, but they were followed up in the outpatients and uh, you know, some of them will deteriorate within two years. So if you think about pattern of progression and severity, uh, what is the fate of a Chiari? So at five years now, we have this information. Uh, a, up to half the children can be asymptomatic. Three to 5% may regress spontaneously. And then you've got the 10 to 14% progression and 70 to 87% stable condition. So most of the Chiaris actually don't change. Do all Chiaris progress equally? So this is the story you know, that uh, drives us down. And I've come to the conclusion that one simple way to divide Chiaris is simple Chiari and complex Chiari. The simple Chiari is one that does not have ventriculomegaly, does not have cranial synostosis, does not have CSF signal loss at the cranial cervical junction. There are no significant cranial cervical junction anomalies. There is no single myelia or scoliosis. And those patients are less likely to progress to surgery. And I certainly wouldn't operate on them. And then you've got the complex Chiari group, which has, in addition to the cerebellar tonsil herniation, syringomyelia, uh, and uh, a, a group within 30 to 75% will develop a syrinx in this group. And then you have one or more of the above features. That means ventriculomegaly, cranial synostosis, CSF loss at the cranial cervical junction, uh, skull base anomalies, uh, scoliosis. So all of that immediately puts the Schiari into the complex group. And that is a group that is most likely to require some intervention. And then you have to decide what kind of intervention are you going to do for those. And of course, the mechanism of progression and development of syrinx is very much research. Bernard Williams, of course, postulated cranial spinal pressure dissociation. Gardner and others suggested CSF pulsations as a pathological uh, drive to develop in the swing of myelia. Uh, well, of course, we won't discuss those theories now. Uh, but then, you know, in simple terms for the audience, what does, you know, when does Chiari become a surgical operation? When does a surgeon say, I have to operate on this Chiari? And the international surveys on this, and uh, there's a huge survey conducted by the ISPN, uh, I think uh, have a consensus on this. And the consensus is the patient must, first of all, be symptomatic. You shouldn't be operating on asymptomatic ERs. Second is the tonsillar descent should be at least 12 millimeters. And then that you should see loss of CSF at the cranial cervical junction and the appearance or already the presence of a syrinx. So those are the things that drive the vast majority of neurosurgeons that were surveyed on large international surveys of more than a thousand people or so. So, and then how, how, how are you going to treat this Chiari? And the question of course here is, can it be treated by a foramen magnum decompression? So a complex Chiari, it's, it's a formidable problem. And uh, you know, the, Doug is gonna talk a lot more about that with significant morbidity. And these cases require very careful planning and investigations prior to surgery. And I, I would dare say that if somebody, you know, with a complex Chiari with skull base anomalies, if you do a foramen magnum decompression, you're more likely to destabilize such a patient or cause even more problems, particularly if they have personal invagination or atlanto excess subluxation and so on. So surgery should be tailored to the causes of the Chiari rather than to the Chiari itself. And for that reason, in Birmingham, we developed an algorithm to assist the management of those complex cases. So, you know, in summary, I would say Chiari malformation should be termed deformation. And we know why. And second is what is it that is driving progression of a hindbrain hernia? Why is the hindbrain hernia getting bigger? What is pushing it down? Because we know it's not a tumor and you can't get, it's, it's not the tonsil that's getting older and longer. It's the tonsil that is round and is getting squeezed 
you know, like a, a piece of Play-Doh and it's getting elongated because somebody is squeezing it and it's making it longer. So that is what we call supratentorial crowding. And supratentorial crowding uh, requires a pressure from above or uh, something that would be compressing that area. So um, in the presence of a small posterior fossa, uh, the downward stretching of the posterior cranial contents in the presence uh, of a supratentorial crowding with a small posterior fossa. So I, I will show this pictorially because what I wanted to explain is that in, in addition to the small posterior fossa, the rest of the skull is also not that uh, compliant. And uh, th there is less cranial volume than the volume of the brain. And that is why the, the brain is being pushed into the foramen magnum. And then of course you have, uh, with uh, posterior fossa, you have the additional skull base anomalies because this is a occipital somite regression pathology. And somite, uh, the occipital somite uh, is the fourth occipital somite. It also not only affects the opician, but affects the ba uh, basian, the clivus, uh, the, the, the uh, arch of atlas, uh, and the tip of the odontoid. So all of that is included in the same embryological part that is uh, pathological. And finally, ventriculomegaly, because that then acts as a piston drive to worsen the herniation. And if I were to look at the, the culprits or the usual associated culprits with the hindbrain hernia, they are ventriculomegaly, cranial synostosis, basal invagination, cranial cervical instability, and scoliosis. And interestingly, all of those are also uh, the twins of syringomyelia. They're equally um, comply, uh, you know, complicit with syringomyelia. In addition, of course, in, uh, syringomyelia can be associated with the tethered cord, with the um, lipomyelomeningocele, spinal lipoma, or split cord malformations without the presence of a hindbrain hernia. And I will show you examples of that. And finally, I just wanted to tell you one more association of Chiari, which is not very well understood, but we looked at it uh, because we noted patient after patient with a Chiari malformation, particularly the complex ones, had short stature or some. Uh, endocrine problem. So we did a formal study with our endocrine colleagues. And what they discovered for us is that 40% of our Chiari patients already had growth hormone deficiency and were on treatment. 15% had growth hormone deficiency with idiopathic short stature. That means, you know, short stature, but not on treatment. And 20% had idiopathic short stature no growth hormone deficiency. And another 20% were on the obese list, but of course that could be um, the obesity pandemic in the UK at the moment. So when we flipped that around and we said, okay, how many patients with growth hormone deficiency had a carry? We only discovered 1.2% 1 1 of the children with growth hormone deficiency with a carry, suggesting that this is not a hormonal problem causing the carry, but the carry seems to be having an effect on the gland leading that to under a function or, or hyperfunction. So this is a uh, you know, subject of a larger study now because we're trying to get more patients recruited. Uh, and then when we talk about ventriculomegaly, what causes it? Is, is the ventriculomegaly the cause of Chiari or is the Chiari that causes the ventriculomegaly? And of course, you could say that the presence of uh, enlarged ventricles in the supratentorial compartment uh, could, uh, in the presence of a small posterior fossa, could cause uh, piston drive effect and supratentorial crowding, uh, or uh, the obliteration of the cisternal CSF at the cranial cervical junction could lead to loss of buoyancy uh, and block the tonsils and impact them. On the other end, uh, the tonsil at the center of the foramen magnum could just block the CSF flow and cause an obstructive um, problem and cause ventricular megaly by blockage of the foramen of Magendi and Lushka, and that would then cause uh, the problem. And that is very common with uh, a dolichoid dance and platybasia and basal invagination. We often see that. So I think in the end, you have to say that probably both mechanisms are in play depending on the type of the uh, pathology. And a number of studies have been conducted now by a number of my colleagues looking at what if we, instead of treating the Chiari, we just treated the ventriculomegaly. <coughs> Sorry. So we can see uh, a number of papers are put up here. Uh, Professor De Roque and his team did a study on the um, Chiari-related hydrocephalus. 
and they were able to show that uh, doing a, a ETV released the carry. Uh, my colleagues from uh, Liverpool, Conor Malucci, uh, they looked at the initial management of hydrocephalus associated with carry. And again, they were able to show that 94% remained shunt free following ETV for Chiari and 83% with the searing at improvement or resolution of the searing following an ETV. So an ETV seems to be a reasonable intervention, not just to treat the, uh, the hydrocephalus or the ventricular megaly, but also regress the hindbrain hernia and deflate the searing. A larger study from China confirms an 80% success rate in the Chinese um, population. So paper after paper, uh, we start seeing that uh, the ventricular megaly could be driving the Chiari and reversing the ventricular megaly would reverse the Chiari and syringomyelia. So uh, with that in mind, we did a, our own study and we looked at um, what our patients, uh, what was the outcome of our patients. So we looked at 130 patients with 139 ETVs, uh, nine, uh, 10 of those patients uh, at ETV is done for Chiari, either one or two. Uh, and uh, that was about 7% of the total population. And when we looked at the outcomes, nine out of the 10 patients had successful resolution of the ventricular megaly, regression of the Chiari, and uh, deflation of the syrinx. Uh, and that's a very good uh, score, uh, very much in keeping with the findings of other uh, uh, researchers as well. And this is a sort of summary of the patients that were involved. Uh, children of chondroplasia, conosinostosis, spina bifida, isolated Chiari. So 50% of our patients were isolated Chiari. Uh, a couple of patients that are chondroplasia. Uh, and if you look at uh, the Chiari regression, 90%, syrinx reduction or deflation, all of them. Uh, then we looked at the association between Chiari and syringomyelia in our patients. So we did a large study. And of course, I think I give uh, complete credit to my uh, uh, fellows uh, over the years. Uh, there have been many of them and my statistician, Paul Davies, who worked very hard to uh, uh, make some semblance of uh, understanding of what was going on. So what we did is we looked at our patients and uh, Paul said to me, well, what do you think is the association? Uh, and so it's trying to get a clinical understanding or radiological understanding of the association. So we looked very carefully and what we discovered is that the vast majority of our patients with the syrinx had an MRI scan like this. And you can see here, uh, I'll just put the list there because uh, the, it's easier to read the list. Uh, so you can see that there is a steep angle of the tent, peg-like tonsils. Uh, the, uh, the brainstem is distorted. There's dolichoid dance degree of platybasia and the, the occipital bone is quite slanting and you can see the cerebellum is no longer c-shaped it's like a standing cerebellum and these are the patients that are most likely to present with the syrinx so we then started looking at the, the craniometric metric angles looking at these features uh, in syringomyelia so the first thing of course that was obvious is that this is a normal situation the white spaces of course mean csf and in uh, Chiari, everything gets compressed. And that is an immediate uh, visual understanding that there is loss of space in the posterior fossa, small volume. The angle of the tent drops, further reducing the posterior fossa volume. Then you get the kinking of the cervical medullary junction and other things. So once that happens, you know that uh, you're facing a blockage of CSF flow at the cranial cervical junction. And I think this is probably the only slide uh, uh, Doug, that I'm going to talk about skull-based anomalies just to highlight uh, the part of the algorithm. But Menez has already pointed out to us that uh, it's quite a significant amount of Chiaris associated with syrinx come with skull-based anomalies. And you can see the platybasia, uh, basal invagination, a dolichoid dance causing a, a cervical medullary junction kink, uh, blockage of uh, CSF flow, formation of a Chiari. And uh, these are the sort of problems that can't be fixed by just doing a form and magnum decompression. So we discovered therefore that there are a number of areas that can be associated with the Chiari. The top one of course is craniocephalic mismatch. That means anybody that's got a, 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 any type of cranial synostosis, particularly the syndromic types or other thickening of the skull like beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, osteopetrosis, they will have a Chiari because they've got reduced, a reduction in the skull volume. CSF over drainage, 
arachnoid cysts which have been shunted without a valve, uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts uh, done under the age of three years uh, for those cysts, vascular conditions, multiple sinus thrombosis, sinus pericranii, all of those will raise intracranial pressure and cause a craniocephalic mismatch. And then you got this cranial cervical compression, uh, mostly caused by skull base anomalies. And you'll hear more about this from Doug. Craniospinal pressure differential, which is where there is leakage of CSF in the lumbar spine or inadequate CSF drainage, like ligation of LP shunts and so on in uh, buckle and pump implantations. We have seen all of those in Birmingham. And then restriction of spinal cord ascent, for example, in neural tube defects, tethered phylum, diastomatomyelias, uh, spinal lipomas, and so on. Uh, and uh, Paul Davis, our statistician, then looked at all of this and he came up with a very simple uh, association, clinical association for Chiari and Syringomyelia. And what he said is that if you've got a child who is 100 months old, that means more than eight years and four months, has got a tonsillar hernia more than 12 millimeters, has a sagittal diameter ratio with the posterior fossa height uh, of uh, more than 0.6 and a clival angle ratio with the foramen magnum clivus angle of less than 0.8, you've got a more than 80% chance of developing a syrinx. So it was a very simple way for us to know that uh, somebody with that is likely to develop a syrinx. And that, that was, uh, you know, the first time that I realized that there is such a strong association that can be validated on a series of patients. And then, of course, so where are we now? We know that uh, Chiari and Searing is now associated with a small posterior fossa volume, and that in Chiari and Searing, there may be a pathology that's driving progression of this hernia. And if it is, then we call it supratentorial crowding for want of a better name, but essentially it's pushing things down into the posterior fossa. And if I were to show you an example like this, where you know, you've got this kid with severe cranial stenosis, you can see the, you know, the, the skull erosions, the, beaten, uh, the copper beaten appearance, you can immediately understand that in a skull like that, there is no doubt that the Chiari would have been because of cranial mismatch. If I show you an MRI scan like this, uh, you can see the brachyturi uh, cephaly on a patient with clear shadow deformity. You, you will have no difficulty in understanding what I'm trying to explain, the supertentorial crowding. Look at the size of the posterior fossa. You know, the, the, the tent and the torcula are nearly at the opistian. There's no space in the posterior fossa. There's only one thing that is gonna happen the, there's going to be a tonsillar herniation. What is the treatment here? Not the foramen magnum decompression, but increasing the size of the skull, because this is a typical case of craniocephalic mismatch. And any other treatment will probably make the situation worse for this child. So I go back to the definition, five millimeters. I go back to show you a typical appearance of what we consider uh, the appearance of craniocephalic mismatch with a small posterior fossa and tell you that these are the patients that we then uh, treat by doing a posterior calvary augmentation rather than a foramen magnum decompression. And this is a graphical example to show you the supertentorial crowding theory. So if you see here, this is a line that goes from the posterior clinoid to the uh, torculum or the inium. In a normal situation, you can see that at least one third of the cerebellum is above it and that the whole of the occipital lobe lies above the cerebellum. Now, if you look at a child who has got a uh, Chiari, the situation is quite different. The angle of the tent means that quite a significant amount of the occipital lobe now is lying behind the uh, cerebellum. Only perhaps one tenth of the cerebellum is now above that line. And in a more severe case of Chiari, the whole of the cerebellum is below that line and a significant amount of the occipital lobe is lying behind the cerebellum, pushing it even more forward. And that means that a proportion of the posterior fossa is now being uh, rented or you know, occupied by a supratentorial uh, 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 organ. So the occipital lobe is supratentorial, but it is lying in the space of the posterior fossa. And that certainly would qualify in my mind as supertentorial crowding into the posterior fossa space. Uh, and then of course, the progression into the brainstem, 
uh, and the, the incompetent orifice. So we did a study just to demonstrate the incompetent orifice. And you can see here in normal situation, uh, the sagittal diameter uh, in Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 is significantly larger. Both the transverse diameter and the surface area are also larger. Yeah. So what we got here is an increase in pressure on the compartment above an incompetent orifice compared to a normal situation. And those will drive progression of a hernia. Uh, and in Chiari 1, of course, the, the ferment magnum is larger uh, significantly larger. And so this is why we came back and we said, okay, well, let's set this, uh, you know, in, in a strategic manner. So we have then supertentorial causes for carrying, posterior fossa causes, foramen magnum causes, spinal causes. And we know now that this is a hernia, so we need to treat as if it is a hernia. Uh, and the mechanics, therefore, if you have ventricular megaly, is raised into cranial pressure, supertentorial crowding, craniocephalic mismatch, what is the mechanics in cranial synestosis? All of them. <laughs> and if you've got basal invagination and cranial cervical <laughs> junction anomaly, uh, you're going to have a small posterior fossa cranial cervical uh, mismatch. And that will lead to a downward push. And the downward push will also be associated with the stretching of the tissues, which is what I call a deformation. That will lead to a development of a Chiari and syringomyelia. And then the separate pathway is for those with uh, spinal lipoma or neural tube defects. They can develop scoliosis and a tethered cord, and that will cause a caudal pull, and that could cause a syringomyelia without a Chiari. So that's the, uh, the you know the the caudal pull pathway to form a syringomyelia. And the surgical approach, as you uh, heard again and again and again and again is uh, to try and create CSF flow at the cranial cervical junction, reconstruct the cisterna magnum, uh, and then look at, to see whether there's an upward migration of the cerebellum. Of course, we can't push it up. So what could we do? So in the treatment, uh, these are the operations which currently are the gold standard uh, for a Chiari. Huh? I think we're getting bombed. <laughs> so you get cranial vertebral decompression, either without the dural opening uh, or with the arachnoid, uh, or leaving the arachnoid closed or opening the arachnoid and so on. So there's about a, a dozen variations of this. Uh, but we all know that if you magnum decompression, uh, then the opening of the dura or too large a foramen magnum, uh, sorry, posterior fossa decompression, or too extensive of a section of C1, C2, are the, the, the most likely explanations for the complications following a foramen magnum decompression. Uh, and that I think is very well understood and we know what the complications are. So I'm not going to spend too much time in this. Uh, and a number of papers, George Claycamp, I think all of you know him, he has done uh, a significant number of foramen magnum decompressions. He is the first to say that you know the long-term success of hormone magnum revisions is limited, and he recommends that you shouldn't be doing them uh, unless um, patients have progressive symptoms. So uh, we know that if you do hormone magnum decompression, the patient is not going to be cured forever, and uh, more and more papers are coming out now suggesting that you may have to revise the original surgery. Uh, this is uh, a paper from Bob. <coughs> Uh, he also feels that, you know, this is a paradigm in evolution. And he feels very, very strongly that the shift, there's a shift away from intradural techniques in favor of simple extradural approaches. That means create space, make the skull bigger. Most of these are craniocephalic mismatch in pediatric patients. They lead to high rates of clinical radiological success along with low complication rates. And he also feels that the efficacy, safety, and necessity of tonsillar manipulation continue to be heavily contested, as evidence increasingly supports the efficacy and safety of less tonsillar manipulation, including their own experience. Uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, Oxford, they have reported recurrent subdural hygromas after foramen magnum decompression for Chiari 1. Uh, very difficult to treat. Uh, some of their patients were then transferred to us. Uh, my colleagues from Liverpool have also reported that in the series, a percentage, I think if I remember correctly, about 12% of their patients develop iatrogenic hydrocephalus. That means they carried out a foramen magnum decompression to treat the Chiari, 
and the patient landed up acquiring hydrocephalus and the patient then had to be shunted. So uh, this clearly is something that we are creating on the patient through surgery. My colleagues from Ireland, uh, uh, Dara Crimmins and John Cadd, they wrote a very honest uh, paper on uh, the difficulties uh, entitled it, a procedure not to be underestimated, foramen magnum decompression for Chiaris. They did 54 foramen magnum decompressions. 24% were children. They had one mortality. Uh, one third of the patients developed complications. 18.5% uh, developed hydrocephalus requiring shunting. Uh, two patients developed subdural collections like the Oxford team. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the story continues. So postoperative infection. So it's not something that you want to take on unless you are absolutely certain uh, of what you're getting into. Uh, so, and when you look at papers that focus on foramen magnum decompression, doing duroplasty without duroplasty, I think there's very clear understanding that if you do, uh, if you open the dura, uh, you're looking at a greater risk of CSF-related complications, 18.5%, uh, and, uh, you know, on the other way, uh, lower risk of reoperation. Uh, and this is why we completely went away from 2003, so I'm talking, you know, a good 18 years now, ne nearly 19 years, where I've stopped doing foramen and magnum decompressions. I stop operating on simple Chiaris because the vast majority do not need your services. They need treatment by a neurologist, a supportive care. And what we do is surgery for uh, skull vault expansion, for craniocephalic mismatch, or for the treatment of uh, ventricular megaly by ETV, or Doug will explain uh, for skull base anomalies. Uh, and what we do with posterior calvary vault expansion, we can use distraction osteogenesis, uh, which is a paper that we published in 2009. But of course, the, we started doing them from earlier 2006. And what we do is we make a melon slice cut of the skull, distract them with um, a, um, uh, titanium distractors, uh, and then um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bone forms spontaneously is distraction osteogenesis because we distract them so slowly that it allows bone to be set in the distraction area. And within uh, uh, about three months, the bone is hard, um, just like normal bone. And uh, lo and behold, there's a lot more skull space and the hindbrain hernia regresses. The kid is fine, uh, syrinx is uh, developed. Uh, here's an example of amelioration of Chiari 1 with syrinx in a child with cruzones. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I've taken the examples out. They will be at the end. Uh, and then uh, other papers also su substantiate um, that you can carry out uh, uh, a, a sort of for syndromic cranial synostosis, you don't need to do a suboccipital decompression by doing a posterior cranial vault release. This is from Richard Allen Bogan. Uh, uh, they, uh, the Chiari will resolve spontaneously. My colleagues from Finland uh, did the same thing. Uh, another paper from Paris, from Eric Arnaud and Federico de Rocco confirmed that, um, you know, by doing this procedure, the Chiari will resolve. Uh, and basically, you know, our study confirms that if you do a procedure of augmentation, this is what's happening. So if you look at the top, that's a normal MRI. At the bottom is a child with syndromic cranial synostosis. And if you overlap them, you can see what's wrong. There is a decrease in intracranial volume posteriorly. There is an increase in the intracranial volume superiorly, that is the turicaphaly, and the direction of uh, travel is where there is space. So the brain will go wherever there is space. So in APOS, for example, it will go forward because anterior fontanelle is open and the brain will go forward. And what we got is ox compressed occipital lobe, compressed ventricles, and what we want to do, sorry, I went too fast. What we want to do is essentially uh, make the skull into a normal shape. And by doing that, we create enough space for the brain to expand into that space and cause regression of the hindbrain hernia, uh, which in essentially in this patient is an effect of the craniocephalic mismatch. And we know that the intracranial pressure is increased. They've got diploic collateral circulation. When we do the surgery, the pressure drops. Uh, and uh, this is uh, you know, what we've been doing from 1984. Tony Hockley and colleagues in the craniofacial team started releasing the posterior 
scale. I arrived in uh, 2002, 2003. We started doing uh, the augmentations uh, and we then started doing distractions in 2006. And uh, that's now pretty much well accepted around the world. Uh, the procedure basically is a, a skull craniotomy like this. And then we pull that back and then we plate, we secure that with either resolvable plates or metal plates. If it is a distraction, uh, this is a fixed procedure. And uh, I went off the uh, resolvable plates because the pressures from the, the muscles are so significant that the, the resolvable plates buckle. So I started using metal plates and the results have been significantly better. Uh, you can also, in ch all the children, uh, you can also do a parietal expansion. So it's like a Greek helmet procedure. So you cut the occipital bone and the parietal plates and push them back and secure them. Uh, this is an intraoperative example. So you reflect the scalp like in a craniofacial procedure. Uh, patient is lying prone. Uh, you can see the, uh, I've just moved the green thing. So you can see there's a shunt here on this patient. Uh, and what you do is you keep a small island of bone around the shunt. Uh, this is the back cut. The forward cut will be around like this. Uh, and then you can see this is the occipital piece with a bit of bone around the shunt two parietal plates, uh, and then in the midline, take the bone off uh, the uh, sinus uh, so that the, uh, the venous congestion is removed, uh, put the uh, bones back. And this is when I was using the resolvable plates. So you can see the plates there. Uh, they hold everything together and close the patient. No opening of the dura, no other manipulation. Uh, and then post-op uh, scans look like this. And over a period of time, uh, the patient's uh, Chiari will regress. Uh, sorry, this is stuck. Yeah, so you, you've, this is the other technique. So with distraction osteogenesis, that was fixed. This is what we call dynamic uh, osteogenesis. What we do is every day we distract half a millimeter in the morning, half a millimeter in the afternoon. Uh, that means one millimeter a day for 21 days. And that gives a lot more time for the skin to stretch and for the bone to settle. Uh, and then we'll leave that for a period of time to consolidate bone formation. And this is the pre-op appearance. You can see the very small posterior fossa. This is the melon slice cut. Uh, and you can see the flat occiput in the back. And this is after distraction uh, with the ball angle. This is the telescopic distractors that distract the bone. Uh, and you can see that there is no uh, non-union. The bone fuses uh, very, very nicely. We haven't put any bone grafts there. This is done naturally. So this is a pre-op appearance. You can see the flat occiput, post-op appearance. Uh, and then um, no. that causes the increase in the posterior fossa volume just by doing that distraction. These are serial radiographs to see the uh, distraction with the telescopic distractors. And this is the appearance of the child as the distractors are done. You can see the brachyturi cephaly going into complete a round head. Uh, we looked at the 10-year uh, follow-up of these children, and uh, we can tell you that uh, in these children, um, okay. this is procedures, uh, what we can uh, show you is that the searing size improved in 75% of the patients, uh, and in those patients, uh, uh, NPR in 100%. And now I'm just going to show you one case of uh, sacral lipomalomeningocele with cord tether, holocaust, um, searing, at the blood and bowel dysfunction, a late presentation. So this child was already something like 15 years old. And you can see this is the before surgery, uh, complete sort of Holocaust series uh, with the uh, lipoma at the bottom there. And this after surgery, uh, the, uh, the decompression uh, of the, um, the series followed um, just untethering of the spinal cord. Uh, you can see that uh, before and after. So complete Holocaust searing. And just by simple untethering, there was no Chiari associated. So the treatment of searing uh, when associated with the tethered cord should be the untethering of the cord. And this is just to show you the testing of an algorithm in failed case of Harman magnum decompression. So I had this child who had a Chiari and syringomyelia. Uh, my colleagues carried out the cranial vertebral decompression uh, in 2014, uh, the, the child simply deteriorated with worsening searings. 
so they did a second convertible decompression. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the first one, pre-op images. Uh, you can see quite a extensive searing, uh, good going Chiari, tight crane cervical junction, uh, uh, first post-op images. This, you can see you know, the nice form in, uh, formation of uh, CSF space around the Chiari. So that would be considered as a adequate form in magnum decompression. Uh, but I would say, you know, the tonsils really haven't uh, shifted. Uh, the syrinx didn't really move. Uh, the patient didn't get any better. Uh, at that point, there was no scoliosis. Uh, and of course, the child then started becoming clumsy, started developing uh, curvature. Uh, so following further discussion, in this case was referred to Dominic Thompson. Dominic suggested that there may be uh, some ongoing compression at the cranial cervical junction, which, uh, which I agreed. So uh, the patient went for a second operation. By then, the syrinx had progressed even more. You can see the CSF had a, uh, a cystana magnet disappeared. So he went a second procedure in 2017, uh, but uh, there was no improvement. The child by then had developed scoliosis, had become clumsy. The syrinx just continued to get bigger and bigger. So in 2018, um, I was then approached and asked to do posterior recovery augmentation. Uh, I, I thought that it would help. Uh, and this is uh, before surgery, and this is after surgery. And you can see the immediate difference here is a CSF all over the brain. If you look here, you can only see CSF in front, no CSF anywhere else, no CSF in the cerebellum. It's a craniocephalic mismatch. Even though it doesn't look like that, once we made the skull bigger, you can see the sulcal CSF equally spread everywhere, including the top of the cerebellum, the reformation of the cisterna magnus space. And this was completely a supra, uh, the, this uh, augmentation was above the torcular. We didn't go down there. And at this point, even though there is still tonsils there, which they haven't completely gone because we didn't operate here, you can see the deflation of the syrinx is quite significant. And that, uh, this is before and this is after. For the whole of the thoracic uh, syrinx, a very rapid decompression within three months of the surgery. And this is why I'm 100% convinced that uh, the, in those patients where there is a craniocephalic mismatch, you really have to consider a calvary augmentation uh, because these patients will, uh, who have firm and magnum decompression, they will just have cerebellar sump more and more rather than uh, get an improvement. So this is where the algorithm is coming together. And I'm just nearly finishing now. So uh, as we discussed, this is the uh, pathophysiology of Chiari and Syrinx formation. And then if we flip it around, we could say that a patient with Syringomyelia and Chiari, if the patient has ventricular megaly, I would just recommend doing an ATV and assess. If the patient improves, great, <coughs> and monitor. If the patient fails to improve, then my next step usually is to recommend a posterior calvary augmentation. And the same um, recommendation I would give for patients with uh, cranial synostosis or those who have scoliosis requiring correction, I would offer them a, a, uh, a posterior calvary augmentation for their Chiaris because in nearly one third of patients with scoliosis, we have now not had to progress to scoliosis surgery by simple uh, decompression or, or augmentation of the skull for Chiari. And if they have basal invagination and cranial cervical junction anomalies, and of course, this part I'm going to leave to Doug to discuss, uh, then I think, you know, some surgery to that area would be more relevant than just doing a form and magnum decompression. And if you have, a, uh, if you have no Chiari, but a significant uh, searing associated uh, with a, a tethered cord, then untethering of the cord may relieve the syrinx. So that's uh, the, the um, protocol that we are now following in Birmingham. And I wanted to recommend it to you. Uh, and I'm going to conclude now. I've taken more time than I should have. Uh, the Chiari malformation should be termed deformation uh, because of the reasons I explained. And the causes of hindbrain herniation, the progressive hindbrain herniation, are definitely supratentorial crowding. And that could be ventricular megaly, it could be a tumor, it could be anything that is pushing the contents of the, foramen, uh, of the posterior fossa downwards. And we call that supratentorial crowding. Ventricular megaly may play a role. And of course, 
the, the small posterior fossa goes hand in hand with skull base anomaly, so they would be playing a role as well. And when it comes to the searing, uh, there are two types of searing that are recognized here. One is the distal searing with the holocaust, sorry, distal searing uh, with or holocaust searing, and those could be caused uh, not by a Chiari, by, by, or, but by a caudal traction of the spinal cord. And the cervical or cervical thoracic or holocaust searing which is caused by the Chiari and surgery for the Chiari would relieve that and the scoliosis. So that's the, the treatment. And I'll, I'm gonna stop here and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Girish. They, they would always say when I worked in Birmingham that it never rains in Birmingham, it only pours. <laughs> and I think uh, this uh, amazing plethora of knowledge that you've shared with us has been um, fascinating uh, journey uh, through the various um, nuances of the Chiari malformation. But thank you very much. If you now stop sharing your screen, we'll bring Doug in and who's been waiting patiently. And now before we'll take questions at the end and I'd invite Doug to give us his talk on complex Chiari malformations. Doug, all yours. I think he needs to unmute. I think you're muted. There we go. Yeah, that's better. All right, we're going to try this again. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, uh, I just wanted to thank Goresh for an amazing presentation. It's just fantastic. And I always learn so much from when you uh, discuss your cases and your insight. And I also wanted to thank Sandeep for the amazing invitation to be part of this uh, symposium in this webinar. Um, I was given the task to talk about complex Chiari, kind of what it is, uh, and at least in my way of looking, kind of what to do with it. Uh, I don't have any relevant disclosures. I wanted to begin by just extending everybody greetings from my neck of the woods, Utah. It's uh, eight in the morning here, so a little bit different. Uh, and welcome you to our beautiful state. If you decide to come here and visit, lots of things to do, winter activities, summer activities. So uh, we uh, would love to have you and would love to host you. So, um, this picture I like to start with, it's from our friend, uh, uh, friends Dominic Pang and, um, I mean, Dockling Pang and Dominic Thompson. And it really uh, uh, captures the essence of the complex embryology of the craniocervical junction with the, uh, starting off with the somites and the resubmit resubmitted sclerotome structures arriving in the final very complex area of the craniocervical junction and it's definitely the most embryologically most volatile place in the entire spine. And we see it day in and day out. We all see it as pediatric neurosurgeons and uh, we have to manage the consequences. So this is always the, a good place to start with. It, it's kind of sobering in a way, but we uh, uh, have, have, to, have to know this and we have to uh, appreciate it. So what's a complex Chiari? When is it reasonable to perform a fusion? Obviously not all patients need fusions, but some of them do. Uh, if you're gonna do it, how, how do you do the procedure? And then what's the long-term outlook? Uh, and uh, Goresh had uh, presented a case of continued syrinxes and scoliosis and reherniation and all this. And what's the outlook of these patients? And what are the, just to give you a quick update of the potential genetics involved in some of this um, uh, pathology and what we've been uh, finding in some of the studies we've been doing. So let me just give you a quick um, uh, case here. So it was a three-year-old boy, comes in with a, with a, a simple Chiari, he's got suboccipital headaches, sort of oropharyngeal apraxia, uh, which is fairly common uh, in this age group with Chiari 
do a suboccipital decompression and uh, duraplasty and I see him in follow-up six years later, looks great, headaches gone. And I would call this as a success. And this is the typical uh, Chiari 1 type patient. This patient is, is definitely different where he's two years old, again, has this developmental delay, oropharyngeal apraxia. Do the you offer the typical surgery, uh, suboccipital decompression, tonsillar shrinking, uh, and duraplasty, and he comes back two years later. He's sort of improved, but not really, but still sort of struggling. And you don't do anything. You follow him, but then he comes back two years after that, and he's clearly got issues with sleep disorders, uh, uh, brainstem findings uh, with, with drooling and oropharyngeal apraxia. And you look at him and he's, he's starting to uh, uh, show kyphus and anterior brainstem compression, medullary kink in, in the Chiari. And uh, this was uh, you know, uh, clearly called a Chiari 1.5 with uh, descent of the brainstem. We're gonna talk about that in a second through the frame and magnum. And so I offered him, I was reading uh, uh, Arnold Menezes papers as well and looking at ventral uh, decompressions for patients like this. So here's the preoperative CT scan in the position of the odontoid and then went ahead and did a redo Chiari posterior occipital cervical fusion with odontoid reduction. You can see the improvement in the space of the odontoid and this patient went went on and did spectacularly well. So to make it, to sort of summarize, you can see three different patients here. Our original patient with this simple type Chiari on the left in the middle is this two-year-old girl that we, that we talked about. And then another picture of a 21-year-old female I saw not too long ago. And, um, you know, the, the common denominator of the, of the two on the right is that they have tonsillar and brainstem herniation, extremely symptomatic from that. And they also have these other combination of, of findings with anterior brainstem compression. Some people like to use what's called the PVC2, perpendicular distance between the basion and the posterior portion of C2. They certainly have a medullary kink and some degree of uh, craniocervical angulation, which is measured by uh, the CXA. This patient CXA is 165, which is, which is normal for this age group. This patient is 122. And this patient on, on presentation was 111. So there's a wide uh, variety of, of, of variation. So just to back up a second. So there are, it's confusing because there's uh, at least three general types of Chiari's that we described. The Chiari one we've been talking about for the last uh, several minutes here where the tonsils are down at least five millimeters. Um, there's a Chiari zero, which has been described with syringomyelia without hindbrain compression. And then the Chiari 1.5 with you have a uh, 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 cerebellar tonsil herniation, but also brainstem and obex herniation through the frame and magnum. And studies have shown that patients uh, uh, with Chiari 1.5 tend to be more symptomatic than those without it. And then we're all familiar with the sort of seminal paper from uh, Paul Grab and Jerry Oaks about the PBC2. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a few comments about that measurement here in a second. So we published a paper in 2012, looking at a variety of factors, including the ones that I'm, that I'm showing here, uh, the, the, the 1.5 into your brainstem compression. We looked at all of these angles and the primary outcome was the need for, for uh, uh, ventral decompression and craniocervical fusion. And this is the, uh, these are the survivor function curves. And what fell out was that uh, patients with Chiari 1.5 malformation with significant brainstem compression in the area or their CXA or their clival cervical angles less than 125 degrees were significantly higher risk compared to those who didn't have those uh, uh, factors before surgery. So this was a, a way to try to describe these very complex patients and come up with, with factors that we thought could predict their ultimate outcome in difficult situations. So many of you, like me, have, have, have followed uh, 
Dockling and, and Dominic's work over the years, and we have seen a lots of MRIs and CT scans. And I love these pictures that Dockling has put together uh, over time. And and this one on the upper left shows the normal relationship of the craniocervical junction and the various measurements. And as we all know, on the right hand side, there's a wide variety of of, of possible orientations and sizes of these skull based structures from the tuberculum down to the basion with flat, a flat clivus or a steep clivus or a short clivus in the relationship to the craniocervical junction. And then Dockling hypothesized that there's a, there's a change in what he termed the, the clival dense pivot point here and where the uh, um, uh, occipital condyles articulated with C1. And I looked at this and I think he was on to something here and he was taking more of a biomechanical approach which I really appreciated. And uh, uh, it's it, and it's been the genesis of some of the work that we've been doing recently. So I wanted to share a new concept that we just published, which I think is interesting. And I, I looked at the adult deformity literature. There's a lot of, of, of uh, uh, information out there. Everybody knows about the, the, uh, the, the cervical SVA, the C2 SVA for complex cervical deformities in, in adult patients. But nobody's really looked at the relationship of the craniocervical junction and the cervical spine. And I started looking at the relationship of the occipital condyle, the middle of the condyle and the C1 um, uh, uh, anterior uh, articulating surface and that joint there, the relationship of that structure with the C23 disc space, which is the first disc, the first true disc space uh, in the, in the uh, spine below that area. In its relationship of where uh, of where they are I, I, is genetically determined. Essentially, You've never I've never seen a two year old or a three year old patient with a retroflexed odontoid. And what happens is that the odontoid is pulled back as the uh, craniocervical junction develops. Occiput C one is um, destined to go to a particular position. C two three is going to be in a certain position. And the, relate, the, the sagittal relationship between those two determines where the odontoid ends up. And I know that's kind of a, of, of a new, different concept, but I think this is very appropriate. So how do you measure this distance, this condylar C2 sag, uh, sagittal vertical alignment? We draw a line parallel to the C23 uh, disc space or the C2 end plate here. You scroll parasagittal and identify the midpoint of the occiput uh, C1 uh, joint there. You scroll back, you, 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 you mark the position where the occipital uh, C1 joint is, scroll back to the midline, drop a perpendicular to your original line, and then measure the distance between that line and the posterior portion of, of, of the body of the C2. So that distance we've termed the condylar C2 SVA, that, that's the offset between the occipital condyle and the C23 disc space. So we looked at this with our large series of patients and we tried to define this role uh, of, of, of what it looked like um, in our hands. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve showing if you uh, um, uh, broke the groups into less than five millimeters of SVA and greater than five millimeters of SVA, the line in red are patients with, with uh, uh, condylar C2 SVA greater than five millimeters in the survival function curves for uh, requiring occipital cervical fusion. So we thought that we were on to something and we compared how uh, that was predictive uh, versus the, um, uh, the PVC2 uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the CXA. And we decided to validate our findings with the larger Park Reeves Cerebral Myelia Research Consortium database. This was articles recently published in JNS Peds. And this was, we, we contributed very few patients to the Park Reeves Cerebral Myelia Research Consortium. Uh, so it was mostly outside centers, but a certain number of patients in their, in their uh, uh, group um, had excuse me, it's auto advancing here. Certain patients in their group had craniocervical fusions. So you can see the, the need for prediction for craniocervical fusions 
uh, for the uh, uh, univariate analysis, uh, the CXA and the C2, S the CC2 SVA were highly predictive of needing a cranial cervical fusion, much less more so for the PBC2. For the sensitivity and specificity for an occipital cervical fusion, you can see the uh, condylar C2 SVA was 100% sensitive and 86% specific, which you know tells me if, if you have this, um, if, if, if the test is positive, do you have the disease? So what that's telling me is that if the condylar C2 SVA is greater than eight, 100% of the patients who required fusion had that distance that was greater than five millimeters. Whereas it, when you compare to the other uh, discriminating factors, PBC2, CXA was less sensitive, but the PBC2 was surprisingly weak in predicting uh, uh, whether they required a fusion. And again, here's the uh, Kaplan-Meier analysis showing this is in the large group, it was over 800 patients. And I believe there were over 40 patients who required fusions around uh, North America. And this, these were the results. So here's looking at the uh, condylar uh, C2 SVA in the black line here and uh, in, in discriminating between the, uh, the CXA greater and less than 125 degrees. And again, you can see the uh, survival function curve showing that a CXA less than 125 degrees is highly predictive of needing the procedure. So that gives us sort of a biomechanical foundation from which to work with to try to make better decisions about whether patients need surgery. Uh, we see a lot of these, I, I see a lot of these patients from around the country and trying to make the decisions is really difficult. So in my mind, indications for proceeding with fusion, certainly you need to have the radiographic criteria, which we were just talking about, plus you need some uh, uh, degree of these other findings alone or in combination, brainstem symptomatology, myelopathy, uh, severe headaches, I'm going to expand on that in a second, or progressive or severe uh, unresolved syrinx. So the severe headaches, uh, we've seen kids who've had significant uh, Chiari's uh, they have cranial cervical kyphosis. You do a standard suboccipital decompression uh, with, a, with or without a duraplasty. And they do fine originally, but over a period of time, over maybe eight months or a year, they start to have severe, uh, significant lifestyle limiting headaches. And, uh, and, and you can do, you can put them in uh, uh, cervical collar. Sometimes they get uh, improvement. But it's, it's a biomechanical process that results in micromotion and progressive uh, uh, kyphosis that results in a very significant amount of, of, of uh, headache and neck pathology and pain. And many times going ahead and fusing those patients is, is, is a, an amazing surgery. You don't want to do those too often and, and, and too frequently. You don't want to offer that too often. But if the patient needs it and you perform the surgery, it's a life-changing procedure for them. So how do we do it? Uh, again, mo most of the patients up front have the suboccipital decompression and C1 laminectomy. Um, if necessary, you redo the Chiari exploration with or without tonsillar shrinking and duraplasty. Most of the time you can leave that alone because the tonsillar herniation is not an issue. I like to put uh, bilateral PAR screws. Most of these patients have fairly normal anatomy and you can get good solid C2 PAR screws in. I use a rod plate construct that, that goes from the top loading C2 screws to the back of the skull. And then the odontoid reduction, I do that manually. They have, they're in Mayfield pins. You do a, a distraction and then an extension in uh, that brings the odontoid forward. And then when you're in that position, you lock that in place and you uh, confirm the position with an intraoperative O-arm spin. If you don't have an O-arm, then you're confirming it with, uh, with fluoroscopy. I almost always use autographed rib for my uh, fusion substrate. Uh, I've been very happy with that over the years. You cut the rib long enough so it spans, has to go long distance between C2 and past the area where the, uh, sub or the, uh, the uh, craniectomy is. So it needs to be fairly long. And then I 
wrap the rib with, uh, with a, a, a multi-stranded titanium cable and put um, uh, screws through the top of the uh, uh, rib graft into the occiput. And I don't use DBX anymore. I use uh, a very small amount of BMP. I cut an extra, extra small kit of BMP into small pledgets, place those pledgets between the uh, autograft and the recipient bone. And then I'm placing screws through that or, um, uh, or again, in the case of the C2 area, placing the pledges between the rib and C2 and wrapping it with a cable and getting the compression uh, against the bone for the fusion. This is what it looks like after surgery. Uh, again, you can see the little screw through the rib here and the cable around the rib grafts as well. So we're in the middle of, of following these patients uh, long-term. This is our initial um, uh, results. Uh, we did 26 of these uh, in this period of time. Uh, and all of them had successful arthrodesis with low complication rates. Uh, and like I stated before, all of these patients had improvement of their preoperative symptoms, oftentimes dramatically. They would go home and they would just be just different different patients and, and they would uh, do really well over the long haul. And we're looking at this uh, at, uh, uh, with our current fellow to follow these patients up long-term. So my biomechanical hypothesis is that patients with these complex Chiari's with risk factors, the Chiari 1.5 is certainly one or a CXA less than, uh, less than 125 degrees. I would include the condylar C2 SVA greater than five as a risk factor at this point as well. Get this to advance. My computer's kind of skipping around here. I apologize. There we go. And as during these procedures, you perform your dorsal decompression, but you also release the posterior tension band in the cranial cervical region. And then you can get uh, not necessarily settling, but accentuation of the forward bending movement of this clival dental pivot point, especially if their C2 SVA is, is abnormal and you get forward folding of the cranial cervical angle. And then obviously you're going to get progressive brainstem compression and worsening of signs and symptoms. So I think that in my mind, there's straightforward or more simple Chiari malformations, uh, which uh, probably have more to do with the, the, the cranio uh, uh, cerebral metrics, uh, like uh, Garish was talking about, was most small posterior fossa volumes, supertentorial crowding, probably hydrodynamic imbalance to some extent plays a role. But I think that these complex Chiari malformations can be think of driven by more genetically driven forces with the uh, clival cervical relationships, the position of the odontoid and the occipital condyles versus the uh, uh, C23 disc space in basilar invagination. All of these come into play and this is all genetically driven. And then if you either, if before you do surgery or after you do surgery, there's certainly biomechanical stress. Uh, but in, in the preoperative state, obviously these, these changes are happening very slowly, but if you do them uh, if, you, if, if you operate on these patients, these, these changes tend to accelerate and uh, can occur fairly quickly in a matter of months. And then we have very poor understanding of hydrodynamic factors in relationship to this. And there's people working on these uh, issues uh, as we speak. This is fascinating. And I think that uh, computer modeling technique and experimental techniques will be very, very helpful in uh, unlocking some of these. So to start to sum up, you know, where does this leave us? Uh, we all know that these complex care patients are very, very challenging. Multiple issues must be recognized simultaneously, considered and pursued. We're really after symptom management to get these kids as functional as we possibly can. We have to take into account the intracranial um, factors and how the, how, the, uh, uh, how, how the brain was formed but also the biomechanical stresses that the patient is seeing and how that may lead to failure. Serosis and scoliosis, is, and, and, and scoliosis is, is very much part of this picture. 
And many times we will do these to, in order to alleviate syringomyelia, and that's a talk in and of itself, as well as scoliosis. We really want to avoid excessive procedures. Um, unfortunately, uh, many people, it, it, it's difficult uh, for uh, patients to come in with complex uh, <coughs> radiographic findings and start talking about an upfront fusion and odontoid reductions and odontoidectomies and so forth when they're relatively asymptomatic. So many uh, physicians do a stepwise procedure and go at it sort of one thing at a time, but that may not be the best way to do it too. And I, I think that we're, we're, we're learning and trying to uh, 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 do the most with what we have. And can we just, with giving modern techniques, can we manage this severe condition with just one procedure from the posterior direction. Some people will proceed straight to that. Some people won't. And, and we're trying to figure out which one would work the best. And where does odontoidectomy fit in? In my mind, I'm managing almost all of these patients posteriorly with decompressions, fusions, odontoid reductions. If patients have a, have a stable fusion, we've had an, a, an attempt at odontoid reduction, but still have brainstem anterior uh, uh, brainstem compression and symptoms from that, then we're doing the odontoidectomy. And we've been doing all those endoscopically for the last uh, eight or nine years and have had have really nice results with that and, and really, really happy with that procedure. So here, our, our current algorithm, sorry, this is jumping around again, so I can get this to, there we go. So simple Chiari with the suboccipital decompression, laminectomy with or without a duroplasty, the complex Chiari, if this slide behaves, uh, which is defined in my mind so that uh, condylar C2SVA less than five or a CXA greater than 125, you're thinking about uh, the, the, the standard procedure. If these risk factors are positive and they have bulbar symptoms or myelopathy, then you're thinking about the posterior decompression with a potentially odontoid reduction infusion, sometimes up front. And if that fails and they still have uh, 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 compression or symptoms, then you're doing that odontoidectomy. So I did the last slide here. There, there have been some uh, uh, advances. There's been a lot published. I just want to highlight, published regarding the genetics of this condition. So I want to highlight two recent studies, one out of uh, Wash U and Dave Limbrick's lab. Uh, there's a gentleman named Gabe Haller, who's a PhD, who's working in that, and we're part of their uh, consortium as well. They've been looking at uh, chromodomain, I'm sorry, chromodomain genes in Chiari 1 and found um, uh, uh, abnormalities in, in, in variants in this, uh, in this domain of, in the genome. And it's been implicated as a genetic driver of the Chiari 1 phenotype. And they did a zebrafish knockout model with a CH, uh, CHD8 haploinsufficiency led to large heads and a posterior hindbrain displacement reminiscent of Chiari 1. And it's a fascinating paper. And it, it may be one of the drivers that's, that's creating this um, uh, Chiari issue in some patients. Our work with what's called the Utah Population Data Bank, where we can track medical records and pedigrees. And we, did, we uh, sequenced a large number of patients in Utah from our patient population. And we found that the Hox uh, C4 gene, uh, which is uh, partially responsible for uh, the segmentation of the cranial cervical junction, as well as other portions of the skeleton, uh, has been implicated in the uh, complex Chiari phenotype in that a mouse knockout model, which was published back in the 1990s by Mario Capecchi, a Hox C4 knockout model. This is the, uh, 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 the, the, the mouse embryo uh, appearance of the craniocervical junction with craniocervical kyphosis. And we have found Hox C4 um, uh, a variant uh, in, in family members with severe Chiari uh, phenotypes. So this is exciting and, and more will be coming here, but I think that there's potentially uh, genetic uh, advances that, that are going to occur. So just for food for thought, this woman, uh, you just, you, you came for this. I know it's Friday evening for you, but let's say Monday morning, you come to your office. This patient's waiting for you with this obvious severe
complex Chiari malformation with a CXA that's very, very low. Um, uh, Chiari 1.5, significant brainstem herniation. What are you going to offer her? So we can, we can debate that uh, in, in, in the next few minutes. So thanks for the opportunity of giving this talk and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doug. That was absolutely fascinating. In fact, we've really had two amazing talks today. And uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I, I've really learned a great deal more than I knew about Kerry malformation. Uh, just one quick question, because um, I know we're uh, over short time and, I, and I'm well aware that you still have a work to do. It's not yet Friday evening for you. So we'll very quickly ask you one question before um, Deepak, whose fellow quickly presents uh, the, the cases that we want to discuss. Um, and that is the question that has come up and been asked by a, a couple of people. Why do you need to bring C0 into the, into the arthrodesis? Why don't you fix with just C1, C2 using the distraction extension maneuver that you described yourself? Why do you need to involve the occiput at all for these uh, complex theories? That, that's a really good question. Uh, it's obviously uh, controversial. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Goel's a good, good friend of ours and he's uh, uh, certainly promoted this over the years. If you look carefully at his paper that he published this, at least half of the patients that he did this already had congenital occipital C1 fusions, occipitalized atlas. So I think a large number of that patient population already was fused to the occiput congenitally. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot to learn. Um, it's possible that just the, you know, the, the DECRA uh, uh, procedure, the C12 fusion may help some of these patients. Uh, we're not convinced uh, that that's necessarily going to help in this patient population. You can distract it, bring the odontoid down, create space. I worry about the biomechanic, long-term biomechanical effects of that in relationship of the of the occipital condyle in the, in that uh, that C two three disc space, like I talked about. I think that's a big driver of what's happening at the cranial cervical junction. Okay, so we'll ask you to answer the other questions that are obvious in the chat box. And Deepak, I'll hand over to you for, for the quick presentation. Yeah. Doug has to go to work, so we need to finish this off quickly. I'll ask my fellow, uh, Dr. Tushar, he has got two uh, short cases, which we saw actually today in our outpatient clinic for the management options, you know, in view of the today's discussion. Tushar? Yes, sir. Good evening, all the respected faculty mm -hmm. and all attendees. I would like to present the two cases which come to our OPD today only. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen. Is my screen is visible? Yeah, just make it big. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, All right. So this is the first case I would like to present. He is a 1.5 year old male child presented with right sided neck tilt with slight paucity of the movements in the right and upper and lower, limb, which is which was noticed by his mother. Basically, child has uh, the no significant postnatal events. Uh, the child has no motor and the mental, mental developmental delay also. Uh, uh, the child started walking at the age of around uh, one year, uh, but the mother just noticed that she uh, felt that there is slight uh, the less movements of his right and right upper and the lower limbs, while the child is having no other neurotic deficits. Uh, so we, on on evaluation, the child had the MRI brain uh, with CBJ. Uh, here we can found that there is a descent of tonsils along the syringomyelia formation. Uh, basically, child also had uh, the complete whole spine study. Uh, I don't have the image now, but uh, there is no evidence of any tethered cord over there. So this is the case of uh, the Chiari 1 malformation along with the syring formation. And we had also done the x-ray of the same patient, uh, which also suggested that there is no evidence of any AD. Uh, AD. There, is, there is no increase in the ADI also. Uh, so what are the management options we will have for this child? Because the child is having uh, the clinical deterioration as per uh, the mother. 
after the, after the, after the child started walking so girish uh, how will you approach this child uh hi dipak yeah so this is a very young child you said it's one and a half year old yes, is that right yes 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 sir yes sir yeah and uh just remind me of the how the child presented was it um uh weakness only or <laughs> some other uh, cranial problems as well sir when the child started actually walking the mother noticed that he he was not using uh, his uh, the right side of upper and the lower limb he was using it is less frequently and there is slight positive movements but child is walking without support and he started uh, like walking by his own developmental uh, like normal developmental uh, milestones okay. there is no delay in the milestones yes okay so i think i mean looking at this uh, there are two things here first of all in as you described uh, the child has got a chiari has got a quite a large sphingomyelia nearly sphingobulbia but also there is a degree of ventriculomegaly and uh, there is the ventriculomegaly you know at the moment i can't see the the aqueduct area very well whether there is a flow artifact or not i think that's something that we need to look at carefully uh, the uh, in these children it's very rare to see a significant depression of the mammillary body but i do feel that the uh, the, the the roof of the third ventricle is elevated to some degree uh, so this child, you know, I think we need to look carefully at the ventricles. If you had some more images, would have been great. But can you tell me if there is any ventriculomegaly as a child had any ophthalmology done? No, sir. No, sir. There is no increase in the health cells also. And on the axial CT also, on the axial MRI, I also have, there is no ventriculomegaly. Well, I can, I can see on the uh, sagittal, there is ventriculomegaly. Uh, uh, and it's probably adequate to put in, um, you know, a scope. Because uh, that's one possibility, and uh, I'm not sure whether the aqueduct actually is open. Uh, in any case, uh, that certainly the options here for me would be that this child is going to need treatment, uh, and of course you would have done an MRI contrast to rule out that the syringe myelia is not because of a tumor somewhere either in the posterior fossa or in the spine, because uh, yes. that would be part of the management to make sure that there's no cause of uh, syringomyelia. And uh, rarely you can have a posterior fossa tumor presenting with syringomyelia. Uh, and a contrast uh, enhanced MRI would be helpful to rule that out. Uh, but I would say I would look very carefully. If there is a possibility, the simplest procedure here would be an endoscopic third ventriculostomy and then observe if the situation improves because you can see that there is obstruction uh, at the uh, foramen magnum. Yes, and sir. I'm not entirely sure that a one and a half year old child should have such a severe uh, seeing of myelia just from a Chiari. Uh, so there may be some additional drivers for this. Uh, and my feeling is that ventricular me megaly may be contributing. Uh, and the alternative for me would be a calvarial augmentation uh, because I certainly wouldn't go and do a firm and magnum decompression. And this is not a spina bifida, is that right? Yes, sir. there is no either cord any or in any spina bifida. Okay, thank you. So that would be my thoughts. Douglas, Back to you guys. You, Douglas, how will you approach this child any differently from what uh, Girish has uh, just said? No, I agree with Girish. I would start with this shunt versus ETV. Treat the ventricles for some <coughs> All right. Uh, can we go to the next case? Yes, sir. So next case is a 16-year-old male child. He now presented us with a suboccipital headache and the back pain. Uh, with there is no other history of any progressive neurological deficits. And there is no history of any bladder and the bowel involvement. Uh, so now on examination, the patient has a power of uh, the both lower limbs, 5 by 5, and reflexes there are 2 plus. Uh, sir, patient had a previous surgery, which is done for the multi-level split cord malformations and low-length leader cord with the phylum terminal. The patient has been operated at the age of 3 years in 2008. The patient has uh, gone uh, from... D4 to D2 laminectomy with excision of the bony spur at D9 level and with excision of the fibrous septum at D11 level with sectioning of thickened phylum terminal. So these are the pre-op images of this patient at the age of three years. The patient is having the bony spur at the level of D9 uh, and, uh, and this is the MRI, uh, uh, MRI of the lumbosacral spine which is showing there is a, uh, there is a low line cord at the level of L4 uh, with a thick phylum terminal. The, the phylum terminal was sectioned and the bony spur was removed. Uh, the, at that time, the CVJ, uh, 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 at the CVJ, there was no tonsillar and there, there was no carry malformation also. But now, the, 
child presented to us uh, we have done the mri of the uh, the complete spine uh, which we suggest that uh, in the lumbosacral spine there is a retethering of cord and at the l4 level and the uh, and the cvj uh, the shows the mri cvj shows there is a slight descent of all the cerebellar tonsils which is over there uh, child uh, this uh, Boy is only having the complaint of this occipital headache. There is no, there is no ascia. Uh, the other neuro deficit. There are no cerebellar signs. There is no weakness in the any of the roll limbs, any of the limbs. Yeah. yeah. So we have this child operated for uh, multiple level split cords. He had type one and type two split and detethering also. I definitely remember at least in the operative notes uh, there was no CSF leak at any time uh, because this is my follow up case. And now this child has come just with the uh, kind of headache. And so naturally, I, it prompted me to do an MRI, and this is how it looks like. So uh, I just wanted, I just wondered, you know, how will you approach this child? Will you approach with the detethering, or will you do detethering with some FMD or C1C2 fixation? Um, how will the um, people approach like Dr. Sandeep, Dr. Douglas, Girish? There is definite caring now. Yeah, but uh... any symptomatic. Yeah, but I, I would have thought, I mean, I would have thought that that's probably not the driving thing here, isn't it? Uh, the Chiari wouldn't cause the weakness and all the other things. No, this, child, this child does not have any weakness. This, yeah. this child does not have any weakness. Only having yeah. suboccipital headache. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, my, so, so my apologies again. So you're saying that... Uh, you want to treat the occipital headache, uh, but nothing else. I, I thought that you said that something else had happened in the spine. No, we, I will definitely. This child has been operated for split cord malformation. He has the multiple level uh, spinal dysphagism. He had type one and type two splits, and he also underwent detethering almost yeah. uh, fifteen years back. Now this child has come with occipital headache, and uh, there was no carry. At the time of initial presentation, but now you see a discrete carry along with the low length to that cord. So, does it go by the traction theory, which not many people uh, agree to in spinal dysphagism? Because I do have a collection of few cases uh, wherein I have uh, a low length to that cord with carry. Uh, how do you explain that? Uh, so, so, I would say, you know, if you got a, if you got spinal bifida, for example, and you got uh, CSF leak. Uh, antenatally, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, is that right? So if you got antenatal CSF leak, you know, spina bifida uh, aperta, uh, you find the vast majority of these patients have two typical findings. Um, one is the lemon head, which is the frontal skull, is sunken in, and the reason for that is because there is a sump effect, and uh, the the sink is towards the the bottom of the spine. So you never get the development, uh, outward development of the frontal bone because it's being pulled in, in the opposite direction. And then the other thing you get is the banana, uh, you know, uh, appearance of the posterior fossa uh, because the uh, posterior fossa is turned by 90 degrees and it's a small posterior fossa again. So when, the, in this case, for example, you, you, you had a split cord malformation uh, with a tethered cord, uh, it's quite likely that uh, some of the, the uh, uh, the, the CNS would have been pulled down to the tethered cord. Uh, you have untethered the cord. You would have expected that things would have got better. But now you find that the Chiari is, is uh, appeared as a sort of a uh, secondary progression. So my first suspicion would be whether there is retethering. And, and if there is retethering, then I would go and untether that. Because to my mind, uh, that, that yeah, certainly definitely wouldn't do a foramen magnum decompression. And, uh, you know, there may be a caudal pool. Uh, I am not sure that, you know, at least I don't have any patients like this, but uh, we had a patient, a, a deformity patient, uh, who underwent a deformity correction, and he had a small Chiari. And after the deformity correction, the patient became quadriplegic. Uh, and the suspicion was that uh, the, uh, the Chiari had been pulled down during the distraction. So I think some some movement of the CNS may go, especially if there's adhesions, may pull the cerebellar tonsils down as well. Uh, but I, you know, as I said, I don't have any experience on this, so I defer to others. Douglas, 
Yeah, so in the ventricles are okay. You image the head. Yeah, the ventricles are okay. Yes, sir, ventricles are okay. Right. So I so I think I mean this is um highly unusual. I don't necessarily think that that, that tethered cord causes Chiari. I'm a non-believer uh of that. And you think about all the dentate ligaments. I mean, how how is how is a tethered cord going to end up with tonsillar herniation? It doesn't make any sense to me, but does, I, but spontaneous CSF leak, you know, with or without, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, meningocele down there, that kind of makes sense to me. And I would probably go with a CT myelogram to make sure you, people talk about prone MRIs as well to see if the cord falls forward. You know, and that can be an evidence of, of no tethering. I mean, that's a reason. So prone MRI, a CT myelogram to look for a CSF leak. This kind of looks like a like a, a, a CSF leak type of Chiari. You know, it's sort of, you know, it, it's, it's unexpected. It's come on and he had a, a spinal procedure. You know, there's a lot of experience, especially in China, of doing scoliosis corrections uh, in the face of split cord malformations with, with excellent results. So I, I think that the general consensus in the spine community, at least the orthopedic spine community is, is once screened to, to not, uh, 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 correct the, the split cord malformations if they're asymptomatic prior to surgery. So that's just an extra bit of information, but that that's the pathway I would head down personally. Girish, will this child benefit from calvarial expansion? You are mute. Sorry, uh, the child is 16 years old, is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, one thing you could do, uh, yes, you could do calvary augmentation, but in this sort of children who have thick, you have to look at the size of the skull. If the skull is thick, you could just shave off the skull rather than augmenting the skull. Okay and create a little bit more volume because that Chiari is very mild. I, I would even uh, go uh, uh, you know, to the point to say that I would investigate this child's headaches for other possible explanations than the Chiari um, rather than consider just because you see the Chiari, it's like a red herring. You see the Chiari and the child has got a headache, you jump to the conclusion that it's a Chiari. But a lot of these children can have other causes like migraine headaches, period pains and other things. So I, I, now what I do is I send all of them to the uh, neurologist and we carry out a very good assessment of the headaches before we do anything. All right. I hand over back to Dr. Sandeep. I think these are two short cases. I just wanted to show it by. Deepak, yeah. uh, can I ask you one thing? You know, how did you manage the first case? No, no. This, uh, this, uh, this child came to my OPD from Saudi Arabia just today only. I mean, oh, we are okay. still investigating. Yeah. All right. What do you think you should be doing? Sorry? No, I just plan, I plan only ETV in this child. Okay. And then probably I will, uh, let's see how the child responds, but my plan was just to do ETV, nothing else. Yeah, okay. I'm sure that would be the, the absolutely right thing to do. And I think there was consensus amongst everybody about uh, treating the ventricular megaly first. Right. If you just stop sharing the screen for a second so that we can see our guests okay. and... Um, to show? And, yes, sir. Um, I told Doug the session would last for a little over an hour. Well, it's lasted almost two hours. So obviously uh, the, the content of the two talks we've had have been so fascinating. And uh, those, of us that, those of us that have watched on Zoom or those that are watching on YouTube, I think all of us have really benefited from this experience. Uh, it isn't even appropriate to make a comment about carry malformations after these two talks that we've heard today. And all uh, that is left is really for me to thank uh, the two speakers we've had today uh, profusely. Uh, Girish, it's been wonderful to have you. And Doug, as always, a fascinating talk. Uh, whenever I hear you talk, I, go back, I have to go back to the books and read uh, again. And it's, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. I, I, in fact, I've been ever since you published this, I think about three or four months ago, uh, in uh, in the uh, in the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, I think in was it April or May that you published this? I've been thinking of going back and looking at all our uh, C2 SVA uh, to see 
retrospectively what's happened to that. And, and, and I'm really keen to do this over the next uh, maybe six months or so and see what happens, what has happened to these patients so that um, I may share this information with you hopefully in the next few months. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very, very much. And thank you, Deepak. Thank you. And, um, and it's been an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank you. And I'm sorry that, Doug, you still have to go back to work while we just yeah. go for the weekend. Thank it's you. Okay. Have a good day. Good to see everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. Absolute Bye. pleasure. Thank you.